So let's get rolling here, Daddy O. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about all the way back to uh, you know where you grew up. Uh, you grew up in uh, Lafayette. I'm born and raised in Lafayette, Louisiana. Yeah. And, and were you drawn to music uh, pretty early as as a youngster growing up there in Lafayette? I, I was. Uh, it was mainly through my uh, my brother and sister. I'm I'm the youngest of three. Um, my brother is uh, about eight, eight, nine years older than myself. And then my sister is kind of smack dab in the middle. Both of them were big into marching bands. Um, and my parents were, you know, very supportive and also very active folks. So they were band parents, chaperones, which basically meant that I was the little kid tagging along on all the band trips. And my dad, uh, volunteered to drive the trailer to a lot of marching band events. And so I got drug along. So as a eight, nine, 10 year old, I was around it. And I kind of looked up and idolized these kids who were just high school kids at the time, but seeing somebody walk around with a marching bass drum or a marching snare drum in the uniform, as far as I was concerned, was like the coolest thing ever. Um, and kind of, if my parents were very like supportive, but also like if I was going to be making that kind of noise around the house, they at least wanted me to do it right. So even at as young as 12 or so, like fifth grade, um, when I got into band in middle school, um, my folks were pretty keen on me taking lessons. And I studied with a gentleman at a, who was a university student at the time, this guy by the name of Brian Nelson, who ended up moving to New Orleans and studying with Ricky Sebastian and, I ended up getting in touch with Ricky when I moved here because of that connection. Uh -huh. um, he was my teacher for four years and was probably one of the biggest influences on, on me as a young musician. Was it always drums for you? Was that the thing that appealed to you most? Uh, yeah, there was a, there was a brief moment when I was a youngster uh, that I wanted to play tuba, but after constant, uh, jokes that my, my grandfather was going to have to build me a wagon because the tuba was twice the size of me. <laughs> um, then, yeah, I was just like, well, fine. I'm not going to play tuba anymore. So I, I, I like to tell people that my first passion was wanting to play the tuba. I can't say that my first passion was tuba because I never actually played the thing. But yeah. um, right after that, it was drums and then being around a lot of the older, older guys in school, um, a lot of my brother's friends that were in school that were drummers. To me, drums, drums were just the coolest thing. It, it, was, it, seemed, it was the most fun. It made the most noise. You made the most ruckus. You had the most control. And, and all, of, all of that, I guess, appealed to, to me as a kid. And, you know, my parents were very supportive and put me and got me in contact with with a lot of really cool supportive people, people that, you know, even today are still very important to me and are still connected. The guy that makes my drumsticks now, I've known since I was 12 years old, you know, and he's been a mentor of mine growing up in Lafayette as a drummer and as a stick maker. And the guys that he played music with, I now play music with as well and have been mentors and, and guys that I've been able to grow up with. And it's, it's really cool to have people that I've known at that period of my life and fast forward 20 years and I'm 32, I still know them. They still know me and I can still bounce things off. And it's also nice to have people that can also remind you of like who you, who you have always been, you know, right. Right. I'd like to think that I'm getting better at various things, but it's nice to have these people that are like, yeah, sure. But, I don't know, man. Like I knew you when you were 14, you were kind of always like this. So like maybe look in the mirror and be a little more honest with yourself. You know? Yeah. Re yeah. Rebalance the perspective there. If, yeah. If it gets out. Um, well, who, who is that stick maker that, that you're still a colleague of? Um, yeah, who is <laughs> that's, that's Frank Kinsel. Um, he owns and operates LA backbeat drumsticks out of Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, and Frank, along with uh, a bass player named Dion Pierre, who's oh. actually uh, the bass player in Dwayne Dupsey, mm -hmm. uh, Dwayne Dupsey's band, um, and a sax player named Denny Skerritt. Um, not Skerritt. Not that guy. <laughs> different guy. 
nice. Denny Scarrett out in Lafayette. Um, we're, we're, they were a jazz trio in Lafayette. And ever since I was 14, 15, they were like my heroes and I idolized them. And all three of those guys I'm still really close to today. And obviously I'm, I'm, I'm probably most close with Frank because I've been playing his drumsticks for the better part of eight, nine years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's nice to have that kind of, like you were saying, that long-term relationship, especially someone as young as you, uh, to have had that long of experience with a group of people of, of such talent. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if it's, it's this reason, but it's one of those things that I'm, I'm very happy to have been born and raised in South Louisiana. And, right. you know, I'm sure people have this other where other parts of the country, other parts right. of the world. But for me, that's one of those like Southern hospitality, Southern community things of just like growing up in the South and having a community of people that you could rely on. And 20 years later, I'm still relying on, them, you know? Yeah. You know, John Vodakovich uh, told me, and I experienced this myself uh, as a tiny kid growing up in Mobile where they had Mardi Gras. And that was that uh, his first kind of attraction to drums was being two, three years old. His mother take him to a parade and the band marches by and the bass drum is right in front of him. And mm -hmm. he can feel it in his chest, you know, that vibration and it just attracted him. Did you ever have that kind of, was that kind of how you were uh, drawn, uh, affected by the, rhythm percussion section of the bands probably um there it's hard for me to pinpoint like an exact moment just because I, I, I was um you know eight nine ten years old and so some of those memories are a bit blurry but right it for me it was seeing those guys hit something that big make that amount of noise um there was a couple year period where I was just kind of hanging out with all those people or like being around the band. Right. So for me, it's not necessarily a specific moment, but just like a period of, of my young life of like, as I got interested in it and as I started to take lessons, that was what drew me to it, you know? Right. So, so it, it was, it was out there and it kind of beckoned, but one, you had to get immersed a little bit to really. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Get going. Well, uh, other than the music you were playing in the school bands, were you beginning to try your hand at other stuff as you got a little fluency on some of the instruments? Um, kind of. Um, drum set and, and, and improvisation wasn't really a focus for me until at least high school, if not even college. I was a, I was a classical musician. Um, that's what that's what I studied. That's what that's what kind of pushed me through school. Um, I did do drum and bugle corps um, mm. for two summers in the pit. Actually, I played marimba and timpani uh, in Spirit of Atlanta uh, for two summers. My brother was in drum corps. My my parents like our whole family is kind of fans of DCI and drum and bugle corps. All right. Um, marching band is kind of a big thing in Lafayette, and so a lot of kids are exposed to to drum corps um so even then that was kind of the most you know aside from classical music right. drum corps was what what i did for a couple years um and yeah actually, i mean i went to college to study classical music as well um by that point i would kind of started playing in like a funk band with some buddies from school um and took some drum set lessons here and there but my my kind of main focus was was classical music when, when I left Lafayette to go to Boston for college my goal was to be in the New York Philharmonic the Boston Symphony you know my, my goal was to be a classical musician full-time were you able to get experience on a wide range of the percussion section uh, as you were in high school there I was um, after studying with uh, with this guy Brian Nelson as a like a middle schooler in around eighth grade freshman year of high school, I started studying with a professor at uh, the University of Louisiana Lafayette, a um, guy named Jeff Prospery. Um, Jeff was actually a long time uh, drum corps guy as well. Um, he's actually in the DCI Hall of Fame as like a rudimental snare drummer wow. and, and arguably wrote the book on how to judge marching percussion. Um, 
and now doesn't live in Lafayette anymore. He's actually in the, the Hellcats, the Marine Fife and Drum Corps. Wow. It's like if there was ever a position that was created for him, that was, that was it, you know? Um, but I studied with him all through high school with the ideas of preparing myself to go to college specifically for, for classical music. Um, so studying xylophone, you know, crash cymbals, tambourine, triangle, snare drum, all the excerpts, listening to all the, all the classics, you know, that's kind of what dominated my high school years. And one of the things that uh, is required of a percussionist in those circumstances is the ability to stay focused and count. <laughs> wait, for, <laughs> wait for your turn. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a bit of a funny, I mean, it wasn't funny at the time. It was actually terrifying, but it's, it's funny now. Um, when I was a junior in high school, I actually won the third percussion spot in the Acadiana Symphony. Um, that audition opened up and at the time my teacher Jeff uh, he was in uh, he was the the principal in the orchestra and the spot opened up and he was like yeah take the audition like you're 16 years old you probably won't get it but like it's good experience like yeah. if this is the life you want to live you're going to be taking auditions all over the world all the time until you land that job um, that was kind of my focus and my mindset at the time. And, uh, and lo and behold, I, I took, I did the audition and won, um, which was really cool. Um, um, so I'm in the orchestra and I can't, I honestly can't remember what piece. I think there's part of me that's just scarred from this moment, <laughs> but I, in this entire, probably like 25 minute piece, I had three notes all three were epic crash symbols. Like without the crash symbols, like that moment just wasn't it. It was all about me. And, uh, and the maestro, uh, uh, Mario Schmoli, uh, born and raised in Poland, every, sometimes he would get real excited. And, you, and, and, and if you weren't really on top of your game, you might kind of not understand what he was saying if you weren't focused. <laughs> And for a better part of that rehearsal, he had been rehearsing just one of the string sections for this moment. And I was kind of mentally tuned in. And as they would get to the section, I would be like, boom, that's where my crash symbol is gonna be. I had it visualized everything, how I was gonna do it. Well, at some point I missed him saying tutti, um, which classical musicians get that, but for, for non-classical musicians, it, it means everybody. So in a rehearsal setting, he said tutti, which meant everyone. I missed it. So I'm sitting in the back, kind of listening, just like, all right, yep. And, and if, if I was playing, here's where the crash symbol would come in. And he gives me this monster cue. And I'm sitting there just looking at him with no symbols in my hand. And I make no sounds. And he cuts everyone off and for what felt like an hour just laid into me. Just like, you know, I don't care how young you are. You're in this getting paid just like everyone else. I expect you to be a professional. And I kind of glance over to my teacher who's sitting there next to me and he's not looking at me at all. He's <laughs> straight forward. Thousand yards there. It, right? was, it, was, it was just like, yeah. hey man, that's your mistake. You yeah. take it. Yeah. And he kind of laid into me on, on, in front of the whole orchestra on, on not being professional, not paying attention, being immature. I mean, oh, I mean, it was a learning experience for sure, but, but yeah, talk about focus. And I mean, there it's, it's, it's quite different in the improvisational world where you kind of are active so much in the classical world, there was a lot of this where I might only have one note, but to put that note exactly where it needs to be with the exact velocity, with the right timbre, with the right sound, so that way it blends with everyone. I don't want to say there's no better feeling, but it's the similar feeling to like locking in with a bass player on a bandstand oh, right. where you're jamming all night. I, I, I got that exact same feeling by just playing one note or just one note and having and that it being just perfect and like 
the ability to give yourself goosebumps on the bandstand is like what I chase, you know? Right. Oh yeah. There's no better. I don't, there may be one or two better feelings, but, uh, they're pretty, okay. but, uh, they're yeah. not many. <laughs> um, so you, uh, you, you went off to, uh, New England to the New England conservatory. Is that, um, I, I went, I went to the Boston conservatory. Boston conservatory. Yeah. Just around the corner. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's, there's what, six or seven colleges awesome. in Boston that have music, big giant music departments, maybe more. Yeah. The, the, the back Bay area of Boston was saturated. I mean, Berkeley was around the corner. Um, New England conservatory was around the corner. Um, Mass School of Fine Arts was right down the street. Longy School of Music was just right across the Charles in Cambridge. Yeah, it was a, it was a it was a cool it was a cool city to to especially as a classical musician. It was a really cool city to be immersed in. Right. Uh, and were you studying percussion? Was that a performance uh, degree yep. you were taking? Yep. 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 I have a bachelor's in percussion performance. Yeah, that was that was it. Had you, you said, uh, mentioned starting to play with a funk band. Was that there in Boston? No, that oh. was, that was, uh, that was in Lafayette. Um, so I kind of always had, like, I had a drum set since I was a kid and would play drum set on my own to, you know, rock tunes, whatever. And a buddy of mine in Lafayette, who's actually a, a film composer now, Andrew Smith, he, uh, I played in, in a, in a local, like, community wind ensemble when I was in high school as well and Andrew's dad Mr. Graham was one of the tuba players and got my contact and kind of got me and Andrew in in contact we went to different high schools and he had a buddy of his couple buddies that went to uh, St. Thomas More I went to Lafayette and we all kind of met up at our buddy's pool house you know like kind of classic high school you know go to your buddy's pool house and jam. And uh, we're all still friends today. And in fact, the bass player is uh, Trey Boudreaux, um, who is the touring bass player with the Revelers. But also right. Trey is the bassist and co-founder alongside Byron Asher and Sean Myers, two other young musicians here in New Orleans, uh, the band Nutria. Hmm. Um, Trey and I have basically shared almost every musical experience since we were 16, 17 years old playing in this high school funk band. And then once we both started getting into jazz and it, we just, we just constantly checked in with each other, even though I lived in Boston and he lived in Baton Rouge, we kept checking in with each other um, and kind of pushing each other to listen to more music and try out new things. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, jazz had uh, some of the older fellows you had, you've known all these years had, had been in, had a, their own trio, but it was more, is it more in Boston that you began to get more deeply into, into jazz? Yeah. Um, it kind of took me to be away from home to kind of realize what I'd maybe been taken for granted. You know, I got a little homesick. Um, I say a little homesick. I got like for real homesick. <laughs> And I like missed Mardi Gras and I missed all that stuff, which is kind of funny to people now because I'm not the biggest uh, like reveler, if you will. And I'm not the biggest like Mardi Gras fan now. But back when I was 18, 19, it was a bit of a culture shock to leave South Louisiana and go to Boston. Like, I didn't own a coat at the time. It's like winter sucks. It's cold. <laughs> ice is terrible. I fell all the time. Like I didn't know how to walk on ice. Right. You know? And, uh, and I just missed home and I started to go back and listen to music that I kind of grew up on. So I started listening to Cajun and Zotico music and listening to Mardi Gras music. And as you know, like the moment you start listening to Mardi Gras music and brass band music, it's not far off before you're listening to Louis Armstrong and you're listening to basically the entire lineage of jazz as it has come through New Orleans. And that was kind of when I realized like, how incredible that music was and how much fun I had listening to it. And when I started to try and play it even more, um, that also kind of coincided with being very, being deeply immersed in a very, very kind of hyper-focused, hyper-technical 
uh, hyper competitive classical music environment right. that is a very small conservatory in a city of other small conservatories where everything just like you're just so zoomed in. Um, yeah, I, I didn't like being so zoomed in and, and I kind of uh, didn't like being around classical musicians very much. Did you uh, happen to meet any of the uh, New Orleans guys that were either at Berkeley or the Manhattan Conservatory in the, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, New England Conservatory in those days? Uh, yeah, so I ended up actually getting a job working at uh, this place called the Regatta Bar in Cambridge. Yeah, I know. Um, at that, I, well, I guess kind of still, there's only really like two like proper jazz venues in Boston, and it's the Regatta Bar and Scullers. And uh, I ended up getting a job just as like a food runner. I, I was I was becoming more and more interested in improvisation, and as kind of like you know classical kid by day, jazzer by night. I would go to the club and I would work at the club, just wiping tables, running food, restocking the bar. But at the time, that club was booked by Blue Note, so all the Blue Note artists that came into Boston would all come through. So I got a chance to just see my heroes. And uh, at that time, Joe Dyson and Max Moran were both in Boston. And I remember seeing them play and introducing myself and just kind of saying, hey. So that was really like the first time I, yeah. I'd, I'd seen them in New Orleans before, but didn't meet them. I actually met them in, in Boston. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm probably one of Joe's biggest fans, man. He's absolutely incredible. But that was really one of the first times I like met them and saw them both play. Yeah. Oh, well, were you getting uh, other? I mean, you're pretty busy here. You're doing serious conservatory work by day, and uh, you know, um, waiting, uh, bussing tables at night. Uh, did you have a chance to, to play some jazz with uh, some of your uh, peers? Not really. Um, yeah, I wasn't really tapped into. The, the jam sessions that were going on at Berkeley and stuff like that a lot. I, d I did have access and studied with some teachers at Berkeley and I had the opportunity to take some electives and classes at Berkeley. So I was able to take a, a couple classes and some lessons with Ralph Peterson. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, he's, he's awesome. Actually, uh, there was a group of us that were, that kind of weren't able to go home one year for Thanksgiving and he invited, uh, a handful of us over to his house in Quincy and fed us all for Thanksgiving. Wow. Funny story about that is Victor Gold was there, oh. um, who lived in New Orleans for, for a few years with the Monk Institute. Um, Victor was also at Ralph's house that day for, <laughs> for Thanksgiving dinner. And then Ralph took us all into his studio in the basement and we all just like hung out and played music. Um, oh, and I was very much like way over my head. I mean, yeah. some of the guys that were at that, at that Thanksgiving meal were pretty incredible. Mm. Um, but uh, I also studied with Terry Lynn Carrington mm. while, I was, while I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got a drummer named Neil Smith. Um, I kind of, yeah, I, I didn't really play too much with other people. I didn't, I didn't like I said, I wasn't really tapped into that, uh, that world of Boston um, and that kind of like underground uh, jam scene that Berkeley's got going on. Um, but between school, between kind of studying with some of these teachers and between being at the club three, four nights a week. Right. I mean, that was, that was probably the best education yeah. that I didn't even realize I was getting, you know? Yeah. What about writing music, Brad? Were you, were you beginning to get into that? Uh, thinking about that at all? I mean, composing for the classical world even? Um, Aside from some of my, my uh, like classes that, I, that we had to do some composing for, you know, I took a, you know, had to take species counterpoint. So it was, you know, all the classical things of just like, you know, no parallel octaves, no parallel fifths. How do you negotiate this figured bass, all that kind of stuff. Um, I did okay with it and enjoyed it kind of, but composition wasn't really something I, 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 I thought about very much. Even as I did start to, want to play more jazz and, and spend more of my time behind the drum set as opposed to 
you know, the, the, the bandstand as opposed to the concert hall. Right. Um, composition was still a bit away from me. I, I didn't, I didn't really get into that until, until I moved to New Orleans. Yeah. Um, and that was really more of just being surrounded by some, some, some very supportive friends of mine that pushed me to, to compose. How was the uh, classical performance scene in Boston? Did you get, get a chance to uh, play some while you were in school, um, outside of school? I did. Um, there was, uh, I, I had a stint with the Lexington Symphony, um, which was like another kind of like regional right. orchestra. Um, I did some, some uh, actually I, I did a bunch of gigs out there. And then the same conductor from that group was also the conductor of the Longwood Medical Symphony. It was an orchestra comprised mostly of doctors and nurses. And when they didn't have enough people to round out the orchestra, they would call in some ringers. And mostly it would be a lot of the, the conservatory kids that were around looking for opportunities to play. Um, but uh, the conductor at the time was this guy named Jonathan McPhee who has done some guest conducting with the Boston Pops at the time. Um, I played in that orchestra then, and then he got me involved in the Lexington Symphony. So that was probably the most like outside performance right. stuff I did outside of school. So yeah. did you go straight through uh, and finish your degree like uh, four years? I did. Um, yeah, four years in Boston. I stuck around until the summertime and then I moved to New Orleans that summer of 2010. Yeah. What were your, uh, uh, think, what was your thinking coming to New Orleans? What were your intentions or your ambitions then at that point? Um, well, mind you, this is being filtered through like a 19, 20 year old's mind. Okay. But at the time, um, each summer I was coming back to, to Lafayette and, and Trey and I and Dion and Frank, there was a small scene at this pizza place in Lafayette called Desbanos. Um, and they had a jazz night every uh, Thursday and a jazz jam every Tuesday. So every summer I was pushing more to play jazz and experiment. And probably by the time I was a junior in college, I had kind of not wanted to pursue classical music anymore and pursue being a, an impro improviser and a jazz drummer. Um, and on my parents' request, um, they kind of wanted me to finish my school. They gave me one opportunity to transfer if I really wanted to go to another school. But my dad was like, I, whether you realize it or not, I think the benefit that you're getting from studying classical music, you, maybe you don't realize it now, maybe you're saying classical musicians are all stuffy and you don't like it and it's stiff, but the older you get, the more you're gonna realize just how good of, a, good of an environment that was to be a young musician. And you know, I, that was 2010, that's 10 years later. And my, you know, I can honestly say, I don't think my dad could have been more right. I don't think he even realizes just how right he is about that. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. well Oscar, Oscar told me, Oscar Rossignoli told me the same thing. Basically at LSU, his advisor said, look, stay in the classical program. You can go to New Orleans and hang out on the jazz scene and play with people better than you are there and right now and learn. Uh, but you'll never be able to replace this environment of, you know, here you'll you'll get such a foundation that's I, I, that's so true that's so true yeah so you guys had got that same advice from di different <laughs> quarters but uh both both i think look back on it as as absolutely the right thing to have done oh fred you still there yeah yeah i'm here you lose me hello Oh, yep. Yeah, there you go. Okay. We're back. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, um, yeah. Um, I'm just saying uh, you both got that advice and it turned out from different, you from your dad, he from that uh, professor, but it both turned out to be what you consider excellent. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. For sure. And I was, I was also quite fortunate that the teachers that I had in Boston, it, there, there, there was a couple, there's a few year period, once again, just being a, a, a teenager and a college kid and you're trying to figure things out and figure out who you are and what you want to do and how you want to do it. But in my mind, I kind of thought that there was this like hidden thing. I didn't think anybody knew 
that I was having this like inner turmoil of like whether I wanted to pursue classical music or pursue jazz. Um, I've kind of since getting rid of almost all my school material except this one paper that I had to write for a class and the title of it is classical verse jazz. And one of the, the only kind of uh, markouts in red ink that my teacher made was he just scratched out verses. <laughs> and then the rest of it, he just made some comments and, and he was the, um, he was the professor or the teacher of this orchestral repertoire class we had to take um, early on. And he was active in the Boston music scene. And he was kind of quick to just be like, I don't think it's verses. It's like music is music, like whatever you like. Maybe you have to come up with like a professional way of, you know, mm -hmm. progressing through it. But like, you know, don't worry about it. That was kind of one of the only times I had like an outward, like actually said it that like I was kind of going through this. Like, I don't really know right. how I want to progress through this, but I don't feel the most connected with living my life as a classical musician, but I also don't really know how to move forward as a improviser. And I thought that it was just like an internal thing. Turns out like years later, I look back on it. I'm pretty sure all my teachers were just sitting there just like, yeah, we could see it. It's like, it's like it's, I had a tattooed across my forehead, <laughs> you know, cause I look back and, and they put me in, in scenarios where I benefited from that kind of stuff. I played a lot of the pit shows in the theater because oh, right. I was playing drum set and I was, and they put me in, in more experimental and more improvisatory um, concerts. Right. And looking back on it, it's like they obviously knew where my interests lied, even though maybe I didn't completely know. Yeah. And that's just kind of the, you know, those are just good teachers. Right. Even though I think at the time I was probably like, you know, I definitely butted heads with my teachers and, and I, I got kicked out of two lessons with uh, the, my marimba teacher, Nancy Zeltzman, for not being prepared and not being focused. And, and I, like, I think about being kicked out of those two lessons probably more than I think about most things. Yeah. Just well, for, for what it meant and just for like, you know, it's not wrong to want to do other things, but college is a time where you learn you learn how to be a professional. You know, you learn, you're, you're trying to learn when to stand up for yourself and speak up. And then you're also trying to learn when to keep your mouth shut and just be a professional and do the job. And most of colleges, you do the wrong thing at the wrong time, but the ramifications are that you don't lose your job or you don't get fired or you don't burn bridges. You just have a teacher that says, cool, like good for speaking up right now, but maybe this was a time you should have been a professional and, Oh, that time you kind of got caught with your pants down. Yeah, maybe maybe that was a time that you should have actually held back and and just like did the job that you needed to do. That was kind of one of those moments of just like, yeah, cool. Like you work at the jazz club and you want to play drum set, but you agreed to do this lesson today at this time and you weren't prepared. So I'd rather eat my lunch <laughs> and have and have and have like an extra hour of my day than to sit here you know, wasting each other's time. Yeah. Disrespecting the uh, teacher as much as, uh, and, and the, as much as the lesson. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, for sure. Well, all of that was good preparation uh, in terms of uh, getting a lot of vocabulary and having a lot of different experiences, but you, you come to New Orleans, what, what happened? What happened with that experience? Um, oh yeah. I, I'm a, Oscar, Oscar actually laughed. He said that you were going to uh, like me as an interviewer because he said I talk a lot. Um, and I do. Uh, so Oscar can, you know, can eat it. Um, but, You're not uh, Oscar. We got that for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, actually, I, I, I'll answer your question. So why New Orleans is, is I had made the choice that I did want to pursue um, – jazz and I wanted to pursue the bandstand and have the drum set be my medium of expression. Um, and I, I kind of didn't want to move to Los Angeles or New York when I was just a bit intimidated because I, I wasn't a studied jazz kid. You know, I took some lessons, but I didn't just graduate from Berkeley. I didn't just graduate from the New England Conservatory's jazz program. Um, 
I also just didn't really want to go to school anymore. So I didn't want to go and get another degree somewhere. So for me, it really came down to like, what city and environment do I want to be molded by? Um, I would also say that it was probably just because I was homesick and I just wanted to be back in the South and I wanted to be closer to my family. But also even just visiting New Orleans as a kid and coming to New Orleans a couple times throughout college, that was the kind of community environment that I wanted to be surrounded by. And if, and if there was going to be some thread, whether I ended up staying in New Orleans for the rest of my life or whether I moved on and played other kinds of music in other cities, I kind of wanted my early foundation to be what, what the New Orleans music scene has to offer, which in my opinion is community, it's joy, it's happiness. Even though a lot of the music I play might not be the most danceable party music, I'd like to think and I surely hope that my time here pulls from that and draws from that kind of happy, joyous smile on your face, even in the face of uh, of sadness, there's still a joy to the way that people go about their life here. And not to say that maybe moving to New York wouldn't have been good for me, but I wasn't prepared to deal with that kind of like cutthroat, bitter mm. cold right. kind of New York jazz scene. At least once again, like as a 19, 20 year old right. thinking about this, that's, that's not where my head was at that time. Um, and then I had some friends here and my family was here and it wasn't, you know, snowing and cold. So <laughs> all good, all good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all did, of I mention, did I mention the snow and the cold? Did I mention <laughs> I believe you did maybe once. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get you a coat, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just in case you ever have to go back. But yeah. um, um, the, um, um, yeah, that's the thing that I've always loved about New Orleans uh, is that if you come here with an, an open mind and a good heart, they will embrace you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then if you kind of shut up and pay attention for a while and learn what's going on, they'll embrace you even more. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it is a welcoming city if you come to it with the right attitude and, and it's creative community music uh, being just one aspect. There's writing and visual art communities, all, you know, all the arts, all the creative endeavors seem to have uh, a pretty good uh, representation in New Orleans. Yeah, that's the best way of putting it. Because it, it's not to say that other cities aren't welcoming and, 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 and open to arts and stuff. But New Orleans is one of those places that if you're, if it's, it's not hard to get in tune with the vibration of this city, if you will. And when you do so, there's so many people and so many uh different artists and non-artists that are willing to just open their arms and, and bring you in. It's it a great, it's a great place to be a, a young artist. Um, yeah. Absolutely phenomenal place to be a young artist you right. know, for that reason. Yeah. It's um, the, um, well, who did you get to uh, start working with Brad as, as you arrived in town? What kind of uh, opportunities did you find? Um, like like a lot of youngsters, I I I I, I kind of quickly found the the Frenchman Street music scene. Um, I, I, like I said, I was very fortunate that that my lifelong friend Trey Boudreau, um, he was over at LSU and was already spending a lot of time in New Orleans, um, and was already gigging and going out. So he and I actually moved to New Orleans together. He he came to Boston with a suitcase and his bass. And we packed my car and drove from Boston to New Orleans and moved in to, together. Um, I, I mean, when I say we shared almost all of our musical experiences together, I mean, we shared all of our musical experiences. Um, yeah. That being one of the biggest ones of actually making that move together. Um, so through him, I, I kind of got introduced to the Frenchman Street scene um, and did the, you know, sit sat in with some people um I, one of the first groups i had was a a cordless trio with trey on upright bass and a, a tenor sax player named matt gooden uh, who went by the name rev we had a band called the big way um and that was actually where i got my first introduction into actually composing um from my like, music um that group 
um, uh, through the drummer Dave Shirley, who's the drummer in Sweet Crude, uh, who actually just put out a new record, uh, which is dope. Shout out to my uh, good friends in Sweet Crude. Dave, you sound awesome on that record, by the way. Um, him and his brother, Joe Shirley, who's a film composer out in Los Angeles, um, were also involved in the scene. And so there was a really cool community of youngsters that we were all around 21, 22, 23, just kind of graduating from college, playing around the scene. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, trying to think of who, who like, I, like I started to like play with. Um, it was it was probably a, a, a few years before I really started to get out of like my my friend zone, you know, not just being hired by by my buddies, but actually starting to, hey, I got your number from so and so, who got your number from so and so, on like reputation, getting right. gigs that way. Um, but in those first couple of years, I I, or, uh, I did a couple of gigs with Glenn David Andrews, met some guys. Um, through that um but really it was it was probably through like my relationship with james singleton that i really started to interact and play um kind of the music that i resonate with more it's like more more improvisation more comp more composition heavy uh -huh. um I, I i remember seeing astral project when I was like 15, they played at this club, Grant Street Dance Hall in Lafayette. Oh yeah, right. And yeah, my 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 parents uh, let me sneak in the back door so I could get in. Uh -huh. um, it was very illegal, but uh, they let me sing. James still had his, his fro back then. That was the first time I saw Johnny play live. And so those guys were like also heroes of mine. And after being in New Orleans a couple years, I would start to run into James on the street and I would see him at Snug. I don't, you know, there, there came a period where he, he became aware of me and then we did a gig together, I think actually at Bacchanal. Hmm. Um, and that was the first time James and I played together. And then I got to give a lot of credit to Brad Walker. He, he got me on a festival in Baton Rouge. And that was probably like the first like proper gig of original music that James was on. And ever since then, I consider James to be a, 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 a mentor. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to play a lot of music with him. And through him, I've been able to interact more with, uh, with other people. I think actually the, that Saturday at Snug before uh, the quarantine went into effect, that was the first time I played with Larry Siebert as well. Right. Um, and that was because of James as well. Yeah. Well, so you, you uh, kind of organically found your way onto the scene. I mean, from one person to another and one gig to another. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, composition and kind of being, being a part of bands was, was kind of quickly became my focus as well. Um, I, I never, I never quite saw myself as the most hireable New Orleans drummer, you know, like I'm not the most swinging cat. I'm not the most like, you know, funkiest New Orleans drummer. I'm not the most street, like greasiest street beat player. But um, I, 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 I've found a group of musicians that I really connect with and that are very like-minded and writing music and writing music for certain groups has kind of become where I, I feel the most comfortable and the most expressive. Now you've got uh, what two CDs on, under your own banner out now? I do. Um, I put my first record out, um, uh, I guess it was early 2015. Um, and that record has Brad Walker, Trey, on, Trey Boudreau on bass, um, alto saxophonist named Reagan Mitchell, who was in Baton Rouge at the time, now lives in South Carolina, and a, a pianist at the time, uh, who's, I don't think Doc, Doc's in the city anymore, but uh, Doc Sharp on piano. Um, that was my first record, and I wrote all the music on that record. Yeah, that was, that was I put that record out, and then that, that group's called Brad Webb Making Faces, and I actually just released the second record um, this past year. And that one's uh, high fashion. That was high fashion. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, that one has uh, kind of in the last couple of years become kind of my another kind of compatriot of music is Matt Booth on bass. Nice. Um, him, Georgi Petrov on guitar and Byron Asher on tenor saxophonist. All four, all four of us are composers. All three of them are, are band leaders and composers and have their own project. Byron just put out his excellent record on Sink and City Records, Scrunch Music. Um, it's like quite informative, quite introspective, and just an incredible, I mean, it's, it's awesome music. I'm just like a huge fan of that, that record and that group. Um, Georgi uh, just put out a record this past year that I'm also on. He's an incredible composer, an incredible kind of conceptualist, and not to mention the dude just plays his ass off on guitar. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, Matt, I mean, I met Matt a couple years ago when he first moved to New Orleans, and it's kind of been like hitting the road running ever since. Well, and then you and Matt hooked up with Oscar Rossignoli and, and have, uh, are now under the uh, title of Extended. Yeah, that, that, that group is, is probably the, the, the group I'm most excited about. Um, I, 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 yeah, I, I'm the, yeah, I can't, yeah, that, that group's awesome. <laughs> those, those two guys give me a lot of confidence. All the musicians I just mentioned, I, I get a lot of confidence and I get a lot of uh, joy um, and freedom from playing music with those, with those guys. If it wasn't for that group of musicians, I probably wouldn't have started composing music, you know, because I was, was very apprehensive. I wasn't a studied jazz kid. I, you know, I, I felt like the harmony I wrote wouldn't be as cool or as hip as a pianist or guitarist. The melodies I write wouldn't be as awesome as a saxophonist or a trumpet player. You know, it's like, I'm just a drummer. That was kind of my, my mentality when I was a kid. And that's kind of what kept me from composing until I moved. If it wasn't for Trey, if it wasn't for Rev, if it wasn't for Byron, if it wasn't for Georgi, if it wasn't for Brad and Reagan, those guys being like, nah, man, that's, that's, that's cool. That's a cool idea. Um, then I, I, I wouldn't feel as comfortable kind of bringing these ideas to rehearsals or, or writing music at all. Um, and I have that same confidence as a player that like the decisions that I make, not just as a composer, but as a, as a performer are not just, a, are not, are not just accepted, but they're applauded and encouraged, you know? I mean, it's playing music with Oscar, playing music with Matt, playing music with Trey and Byron and Georgi it's like the most beautiful thing ever. It's like, I, I feel like I can't do anything wrong, you know, which sometimes can be daunting, you know, but, but with those guys, there's nothing daunting. There's nothing fearful about it. It's like, I feel, I feel indestructible. I, I'm fearless. And I have like the most confidence when I sit behind a drum set and I look to my right or left and I see those guys next to me. Well, you, you're in the, I think the enviable position, Brad, of having found a set of colleagues some of them are fairly long standing, but uh, still at, uh, you know, fairly uh, early in life. I mean, who knows? None of us know how long we have, but mm -hmm. uh, you've got a chance to, to work with these guys now, maybe for who knows, 30 years. Man, I sure hope so. Um, and, and yeah, you're, you're, you're quite right. Um, you know, it's easy to, to, to sometimes maybe get caught up in what you think you want to do musically and and it's also easy to kind of compare yourself to others and think that that you need to chase that and be equivalent or just as good um because man like this city has an incredible amount of musicians and if you really even just narrow it down to drummers like holy <laughs> crap man yeah it's like tough yeah <laughs> you know like i i know i know joe dyson lives in brooklyn now but he spends enough time in new orleans so it's like you see him play and it's like oh man like that's incredible. Um, I mean, AJ Hall is an incredible drummer. I don't think he and I could be any, any similar as drummers, but just seeing the way that dude creates and produces and, and watch and like yeah. hearing him play with John Cleary's band, is like absolutely incredible. And it could be easy to compare yourself. Cause like I said, like we're not, we're, we're like Different. in no way similar. Right. And it's easy to maybe compare yourself and get bummed out by like seeing all these incredible drummers, a lot of which are like my age and feel behind the curve. Um, 
but like I said, I then instantly go into a rehearsal or a gig with these group of guys that like, you know, even a bad day is instantly just turned right upside down playing with these guys and talking about music and, or even just talking about anything, you know, talking about soccer, talking about basketball, talking about movies, talking about art, you know, instantly I'm just in a better place and I have a, a lot more confidence to know that like, yeah, like I, I am making the right choice and I am like pushing towards the things that I truly want. And I'm, and, and because of them, and because of the environment I found myself in, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not scared to look in the mirror and truly like be honest with myself, which isn't always easy because being honest with yourself means accepting the good as well as, as the bad and accepting your faults, you know? Yeah. That, uh, that man in the mirror is not always the guy you really want to see, but <laughs> yeah, there's no getting sure. away. From, there's no getting away from that cat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and the extended has actually managed to get a couple of uh, launched a couple of uh, tracks into the world during COVID nineteen uh, lockup here. Yeah, we did. We had a couple kind of spare tracks that that hadn't found their way um, into into being published anywhere. Um, and we also like those two videos. will have a couple videos. I mean, uh, two two tracks that we released. Yeah. Um, one by Oscar called Incantation and the other one by Matt called Week Two. Yeah. Um, we're going to be releasing a couple videos alongside those with the local photographer and filmmaker, uh, No Way Pierre, um, shortly soon. But yeah. yeah, we were fortunate to kind of have some a surplus of some music yeah. that we were able to put out to keep the momentum rolling. Have you uh, been able to uh, do some writing in this in this crazy period we're in? Uh, yeah. Um, when the, when we first kind of, when gigs kind of first got canceled, there was a group of us that challenged each other to write a tune a day. Um, that group included myself, Matt, Georgi, Byron, and Aurora Nealon, uh, as well as another composer, Peter. And yeah, we had like a, a Google drive that we uploaded our tunes every day. It was a bit overwhelming to actually try to like churn out that kind of material. And I don't think a lot of it is actually that good, but it, the practice of being able to sit down and compose, there's been a little bit of writing done and uh, in that regards and kind of conceptualizing new music. Um, and then me, Matt and Oscar had on the books, uh, we were supposed to record our third record uh, the first week of May. Um, that actually got pushed back. Um, the goal is, is still to go in the studio in June and record our record. So, um, in the last couple of weeks, we've been able to, uh, you know, to get together a couple of times and rehearse and work on new material. So, and try to keep the momentum, the momentum going. All right. Well, uh, it's been a lot of fun, Brad. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today and look forward to hearing that third record and, and some live performances in front of people uh, yeah. gathered together in, in <laughs> some one place. Yeah. Not, relatively not sure, soon. Not sure when that's going to happen, but, yeah. but, but I, I, I try to remain calm, try to remain cool yeah. and just to like, it kind of be, be mindful and aware during this period and just, do the things that make me happy and playing drums and writing music and hopefully hopefully one day soon we'll be able to play music as well yeah well as the brits as the brits say uh, keep calm and carry on that's it mr fred thank you so much for having me i really do appreciate it you're welcome man hope to see you soon